Hey everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today at the 2020 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Bobby Rizzo. I'm a first-year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and it is my pleasure to introduce this uh, competitive advantage talk uh, presented by Kraft Analytics Group. This uh, presentation is titled, It's All Hoops, How MBA Coverage, Analytics, Fantasy Basketball, and Gambling Intersect. So if you please join me now in welcoming our speaker on stage, Dr. Andre Snellings, senior writer with ESPN. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, again, my talk, It's All Hoops how NBA coverage, analytics, fantasy basketball, and gambling intersect. So as a senior writer at ESPN, I contribute to several different verticals across the platform. I write fantasy basketball articles, um, sports gambling articles like what's on the left, daily fantasy on the right. Uh, I write on the NBA vertical, bottom left, and I write NBA analytics articles as well. And I use a very similar toolbox and approach um, for the type of analysis I do for each of those different types of articles. Um, uh, I'll use a toolbox that might include box score stats, per minute stats, per possession stats, um, impact stats, the plus or minus family, um, or scouting based stats like second spectrum with scouting software and uh, scouting analytics. And the point of this talk is that this, that analytics approach is useful across any of those other five, in part because all of those other five are just hoops. They might go on different verticals, but they're all telling the same story and using a very similar um, set of data to come up with conclusions. So the rest of this talk will be anecdotal. Um, my first main responsibility each season for fantasy basketball is to project the box score stats for about the top 350 players um, in the league. And those projections live on our website for the whole season. So if you were to go to the uh, ESPN.com's fantasy vertical and uh, sort by 2020 projections, you could see now what I thought the players would produce back in August and September. And we use those projections uh, in a lot of ways. We generate our, our fantasy draft kits. We make our rankings. We give our advice based on what I'm predicting is going to happen this, this upcoming season. Well, what about special cases where players are going into an entirely different situation than they may have been in before? Like, for example, Pascal Siakam. So last season, uh, Siakam was the most improved player in the NBA. He was the number two option uh, on the Raptors behind Kawhi Leonard. And he averaged about 17 points on about 12 shots in 31 and a half minutes a game. Well, of course, Kawhi Leonard was taking his 27 points and 19 field goal attempts um, to Los Angeles this offseason. So the question becomes, how do you project what to expect from Pascal Siakam? One way to do it um, is just linear per minute. This is what this guy has been on a per minute basis. He was playing 31 and a half minutes. You project them up to say 34 and a half minutes and those 17 points go up to about 18.6 points. To me, that was kind of the, the conservative low end. I was expecting a lot more from Siakam this year. Another thing you could do is say, well, he's going to get every one of those 18.8 .8 field goal attempts that Kawhi Leonard was getting. And so you could say, if we look at how Siakam performed with his given set of, 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 of shots, and we project that to 18.8 .8 shots per game, well, then he's going to be a 27 point per game scorer. You know, like the three little pigs, that, you know, too hot and too cold. That, that, was, that, that was kind of my band of he'll be in there somewhere, but that's not what I was expecting. Either end is not what I was expecting from him. So um, I started looking into things like the scouting analysis on second spectrum. And that chart, which is pretty small, it just indicated that last year in ISO situations, Kawhi Leonard and Siakam were producing almost the same 
points per chance in those situations. However, the question at the bottom is key. How will opponents defend Siakam this year as opposed to how they defended him last year? So we take that second spectrum. One of the, the things that you can do with that software is go through and watch videos from every play from a given player in a different in a, a given type of play for the whole season. So that top panel. OK, I can't get a, a thing up there. That top panel was Pascal Siakam in an ISO situation. He's got the ball on the, the, the panel on the far left. He's got the ball um, ISOed up top. The man defending him, so Siakam's behind the three-point line. The man defending him is at the, the free throw line. And if you look, every other defender is staying home on their man. And so as the, the panels play out, that gives Siakam the ability to just get a running start, run past the man at the free throw line, and get a layup. And so those were the types of looks he was seeing last year as a second option. Well, you go to the bottom, and this is what Kawhi Leonard was seeing. So he's got the ball at the three-point line. All five defenders are looking at him. Um, in the second panel, by the time he drives to the rim, he's got three uh, men surrounding him, triple-teaming him. There's a fourth that, as it plays out, by the time he goes for the layup, comes to, to challenge. So you're looking at a, a, a player being quadruple-teamed. The only reason all five didn't come at him is that the fifth guy is boxing out Siakam. But what, what, what uh, Kawhi was seeing is more indicative of what to expect from Siakam this year was, was the feeling. So we come back to those predictions um, and I ended up with projections that kind of met in the middle. They were 22.4 um, points in 34 and a half minutes per game was what I projected um, through 53 games. It's, pretty much on. Um, it was within a point of what he is actually producing um, within half a, uh, a minute of, of the, the, the amount of time he was playing. Now, all of this that I've talked about was a fantasy basketball uh, project, it was a fantasy basketball outlook. And if you look there at the bottom, that, th that first one that says FBA, that's kind of a fantasy basketball outcome. It, last season, uh, Kawhi, I'm sorry, Pascal Siakam was 26th in fantasy points per game. But based on the projections that we came up that I just was going through with you, he was projected to be ninth in this season's preseason uh, pre rankings. And so that's on the fantasy front. If I take more of a general NBA articles approach, I would note that there was a lot of analogs between the real plus minus player evaluator last season and this season and what I projected from the fantasy um, in the mid 20s from last season coming up to being right around top 10 this season. And then the third one on the sports gambling front, because last summer, despite they had just won the championship, the expectation was once Kawhi was gone, the Raptors weren't going to be very good. Um, I was in Vegas, was able to get odds on the Raptors at 100 to 1 to win the championship. Now, um, I did not expect them to be that much of a long shot, in part because this, what's being treated as a breakout season for, for Siakam, I think was very predictable. And if it was predictable, that meant that the Raptors were still going to have a number one option, which meant that the team should not take that large of a step back. So those 100 to 1 odds, even if the Raptors aren't expected to win the championship right now, at the time I made this slide, they were fifth in, in BPI. They're one of the best teams in the league, um, one of the top seeds in the East. They just clinched the playoffs yesterday. And you get to the playoffs, you never know what will happen. And so on the sports gambling front, having a team this good at 100 to 1 was a very beneficial thing. So this was just an example of how this type of approach is useful across all of these different hoops uh, platforms that I write for on ESPN. This was another example. This one was more sports gambling. Um, I have an article that runs twice a week called Best Bets. And in this particular, on this particular day, the Timberwolves were favored by six points over the Hawks. 
Now, at the time, I think the Hawks had the worst record, if not in the NBA, then the worst record in the East for sure. Um, but if, if, if I looked at recent history, the Timberwolves were in the midst of this terrible losing streak. They'd lost 12 in a row as a team. They'd lost 16 straight that Carl Anthony Towns had played in. And the Hawks, over the previous 10 or 11 games, were closer to a 500 team than a worst in the league type team. So that was kind of a, a first pass, a first blush, just looking at some numbers to say, you know what, perhaps the Timberwolves shouldn't be favored by that many points. But again, we take it further, we go to the scouting software, the second spectrum um, analytics. One of the things that I tried to do was identify what would be a key matchup for the game. And what I noticed was that Trey Young was number one in the NBA in on ball picks used, um, according to second spectrum. And his big man running mate, John Collins, was also a high volume pick setter. And the Hawks were able to generate points at a pretty good rate out of that set. Meanwhile, on the other side, Carl Anthony Towns measures out as one of the worst on ball um, defenders of the picker uh, in this particular set. So it really looked like the Hawks were set up to have a field day. So, um, again, coming back to our usages, sports gambling, that tells me I think that the Hawks have a good matchup and a good chance to win this game. Um, on that night, they did win, and so that was a, 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 a win in that category. Then on the fantasy front, uh, and particularly the daily fantasy, because of what I just went over, what, what I saw on the pick and roll, uh, or the, the, the on-ball pick, I expected Young and Collins to be must-starts that night. And again, they put up big numbers, so that helped on the fantasy front. Um, the other thing that was going on right in that same time window, this was right near the trade deadline, and the Hawks were uh, in the midst of pulling off this big trade for Clint Capella. It came out maybe a day or two after this game. And so what the analysis that so far has been for sports gambling or for daily fantasy dovetails perfectly into uh, NBA evaluation. Um, what were the Hawks trying to get out of this trade and would it, would it be a benefit for them? And so uh, as we look at the, the, where they were before, the, the top center on the Hawks roster uh, was 38th among centers in real plus minus before the trade. So there seemed like there was a need. Um, the Hawks as a team were towards the bottom of the league in both rebounding and field goal percentage allowed. And Capella was one of the best rebounders and shot blockers in the league. So again, there's a macro fit there. Um, but when you go kind of next level, start looking at the second spectrum uh, analytics, Trey Young measures out as the top offensive player, the top offensive impact player in the NBA, according to Real Plus Minus but he also measures out as the worst defensive player in the league, according to Real Plus Minus. And um, in second spectrum, you could tease out some of the areas that he struggles with, including that he's really weak against drives. Um, so a team with him on the perimeter really needs a rim protector um, to, to help kind of erase some of those mistakes. And again, you bring in a guy who's one of the better shot blockers in the league. And then the reverse on offense, we just went through how Trey Young really loves running this one ball pick set with a big man. And Capella has a, a, a history of that with James Harden in Houston. So again, just on every level, it seemed that this Capella trade would make sense and should measure out well for the, the, the Hawks moving forward. But what about the other side of the deal? So the Hawks traded for Capella, the Rockets traded Capella and brought back in Robert Covington. And of course, this became one of the most famous trades of this season because the end result is the Hawks starting a 6-5 starting center in something that we've never really seen in the NBA. But even at the time, if just taking a step back and looking at the numbers, there were a lot of reasons to expect good things for the Rockets from this type of move. Um, one, Covington consistently measures out better than, than Capella. 
in the uh, defensive real plus minus stats on a yearly basis. Covington uh, measures out as one of the best in the league. But also just on a specific case basis, last season we started seeing times when Capella's limitations as a big man defender were really showing up um, in, in Rockets games. So in the Western Conference semifinals, their matchup against the Warriors, we saw Capella, who had those dominant regular season stats, 17 points, 13 boards, almost two blocks. In the conference semis, those numbers really fell through the floor, including minutes played, because since he had trouble matching up, the team wasn't able to keep him on the court. And so, again, coming back in the second spectrum, looking at individual plays, the top panel shows Capella when he ended up ISOed on Clay Thompson. And Clay Thompson is thought of as a shooter that hardly ever dribbles. But if you put Clint Capella on him, the second panel is Thompson taking it directly to the rim. And the third panel is him making a layup because Capella is not set up to be able to, to stop him from getting where he wants with the ball. The lower panel was in some ways a little more um, damaging, I guess. Out at the three-point at elbow is Andre Iguodala, who's Capella's man, but Capella's under the rim. And so Iguodala's not the best shooter, but you give anybody 20 feet, and as the panel played out, you know, he knocked down the three. And so not only was, on a macro sense, Covington probably a better defender than Capella, but the, this particular limitation of Capella's would not be an issue for Covington. But of course I'm burying the lead because the, the reason that the Rockets were doing this trade was to free Russell Westbrook. Um, Westbrook, who is not a three-point shooter, could not necessarily be out there and maximized with a guy like Clint Capella, who also wasn't a three-point shooter. But you bring in a high volume three point shooter like Covington and put him out there with the rest of the Rockets. And now Westbrook is playing five out and looking at the numbers, my expectation would be Westbrook is going to the rim at will. He's scoring at will. His efficiency should get better. And over the last few weeks, that's what we've seen play out. Bringing it back to, OK, so we've done a lot of NBA type of analysis on the fantasy basketball front, because I looked at those numbers, the first thing that I, after, the, after the trade, the first thing I did was bang the drum that on your fantasy basketball team, if you had an option, you really wanted to trade for Russell Westbrook because he was about to do some really nasty things the rest of the season. And again, you know, we, we started to see that play out. So I'll end off with just kind of a, a, a few uh, success stories. So. Uh, a couple years ago when Kawhi was, was uh, still in San Antonio, the, the, all of the questions was where is Kawhi going next? And so uh, when I looked around the league, I looked at the Raptors and I said, this is a team that has everything but what Kawhi can give them. And so um, when we made articles for the NBA Vertical um, about what, where would we like to see Kawhi go, all of my trades were Kawhi to the Raptors in a package built around DeMar DeRozan. And it just made too much sense to me. So during that time window, like these articles were running in April, May, June. Well, um, again, in July at the Summer League, the deal hadn't happened yet. The Raptors were 60 to 1 to win the championship. So on the sports gambling front, um, those were wonderful odds. Then the trade happens. Now it's really wonderful odds. Um, the trade happens, we uh, go to the, the article on the right, it was me arguing that if Kawhi's healthy through the whole season, that the Raptors are now championship contenders. And then at the bottom, um, it played all the way out through the season. Um, I was one of two ESPN writers that, that predicted that the Raptors would beat the Warriors in those finals. And it was all part of this same kind of package with the same type of an, uh, analytics approach that I was describing, um, describing before. Another one, the Greek Freak. Um, and during the 2017-18 season, I looked at Giannis's uh, production and impact uh, profile, if you will. And it looked very similar to me 
to what I saw from LeBron James during the 2007-2008 season, all the way down to they were the same age. It was just exactly 10 years apart. And so based on that, I started writing articles and comparisons talking about how Giannis was ready to take over the world, that he was about to dominate the East the same way that LeBron did. That, um, so LeBron's first MVP, you know, he won in 2009 and 2010. Um, so the prediction was that Giannis was about to embark on a similar kind of MVP pathway and that the Bucks were going to be top of the league record-wise the same way that the Cavs have been. And so that's another one that we've kind of seen pan out. And I literally took a screenshot just so you could see the dates that it really was 2000, uh, early 2018 when I was talking about this. And then finally, James Harden. I've been at this approach a long time. So on the far left is an article written back in early 2012 when he was still coming off the bench for the Thunder, arguing that based on the analytics, he was a superstar then that was just waiting for a superstar opportunity. And so then, of course, he goes to the Rockets. He proves that he's a superstar. The middle panel was when Mike D'Antoni came in. And I looked at what lead guards had done numerically under Mike D'Antoni's systems. And so in the middle, I make the argument he goes from a superstar to an MVP. And then on the far right, uh, the key line, if I could highlight it, uh, shows up towards the bottom. Uh, we, we, this was after Chris Paul came to the Rockets, was if they stay healthy, they will be enough to topple perhaps even the Golden State Warriors. And um, this article was written in the preseason, so I got to game five of the, the conference finals uh, before that if they stay healthy went away. Um, so yeah, the main takeaway for all of this is that utilizing different analytics improves analysis, predictions, projections, and ultimately that it's all hoops, fantasy basketball, NBA, sports gambling, DFS, analytics, it's all basketball. So we're not telling individual stories that need to be in individual places. We're telling stories that are useful across the entire lexicon of uh, basketball coverage. So with that, is there any questions? So thank you so much. This is awesome. Um, hey, uh, sorry. Um, You've got the sun behind you. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so um, I love the kind of like all the different types of like like analyses that you conduct. Um, but I was wondering, like, say you have like certain like quantitative stats that don't jive with or don't match up to maybe like the video analysis that you're doing through Second Spectrum. So how do you kind of tackle the potential mismatches between different data sources? So that's where the analyst comes in. Um, one of the, I guess, walls that I've kind of banged my head against when arguing with people about the benefits of analytics is there's this sense that um, people that do analytics don't watch the game and they just look at these, this libraries of numbers and say this is how it must be because this is what the number says. And so to answer your question, I think you have to incorporate more information, more data. If you've got your second spectrum analytics that are telling you one thing and you have this other approach that's telling you something different, then you should be able to isolate or tease out why is it that this is telling me something different? Is it telling me something different because um, there's some type of error in the way that I'm evaluating or, the, or in the way I'm assessing it? Or is it telling me something different because it's catching something that I didn't catch before? And so it's all about the analyst and being able to draw from multiple different sources and come up with a story that fits the data, even if the data isn't always what you expect. Yeah, I'm, I'm a kid in a candy store. Um, and so I've, I've got the, the, the league pass. And so 
a lot of times I'm watching based on either what I, if I'm interested in a, a matchup in particular, um, or like anybody else, if it's just games that I want to see. A lot of times that's where I will watch immediately. Now, um, if I have an article that I'm working on or a deadline that I'm working on, then that can kind of sculpt what my general viewing will be. But even if I don't watch a, a, a game live action, I could still DVR, go back and, and, and watch it again, try to pull out the, 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 the stats, the, 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 the important kernels, I guess, of, of game action to kind of help me to understand what's going on in these situations. And you ask kind of how do I measure success? In a lot of ways like this, like this is not, <laughs> I mean, well, I guess it's, I, this time two years ago, I was an engineer. I was a full-time biomedical engineer. Um, now I work at a place where when I go to work, I get a TV that only gets sports channels, you know, and it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't feel like real life. So I get to use a lot of the same analytics tools that I used in the engineering world, but apply them to something that's, that's pretty fun, pretty cool. So, um, you know, I get some success out of that. Oh, okay. Apparently that's my time, folks. Thank you very much. <laughs>